All right, friends. Good morning. So summer's over, sadly, but I'm also super excited because it's cold now. I'm in my element. Um, but yeah, summer was always a, a fun time for me growing up. I was always fortunate enough to be able, be able to go to a summer camp up in New Hampshire every summer with my two best friends. I think we went from the summer after sixth grade all the way to the summer after senior year of high school where we were definitely too old for it, but it was tradition. We had to go. But it was a Christian camp, um, so there was morning devos and there were evening services. And personally, um, God did a lot of work in my life there growing up, and it was called Camp Berea. Um, but this was also a camp that was tons of activities. On the lake, you could do kayaking, fishing, canoeing. They had a riflery range. You could do archery. And they had this one activity called the Solo Challenge. And what the Solo Challenge was, basically the climber, they'd get all harnessed up, and you'd be on belay with the instructor to make sure you were safe in case you fell. And there was this 20-foot wooden pole with rungs on the side of it. And so you would climb this 20-foot pole, and once you got to the top, you would basically need to find your footing, and you'd need to stand on top of this pole 20, foot, 20 feet in the air. Now, kind of imagine it like a telephone pole, a little bit more narrow than that, right? So once you had your footing, the next step of this thing called the solo challenge was jumping off of it and catching this trapeze that was probably six or seven feet in front of you, probably six feet above the top of the pole, and you just want to catch the trapeze. And you would have successfully caught, you would have successfully completed the solo challenge. Now, most kids, they could climb the pole fairly easily. Definitely getting your footed and standing on top of the pole was a little bit tricky because it was wobbly. But what would happen next was you'd be on top of the pole and you'd have your eyes locked on the trapeze, but then you'd freeze up and it became a mental game. What if I don't catch the trapeze? Marcus caught the trapeze and he's the coolest kid in camp. And Am I not as cool as Marcus? What if I fall? What is everyone watching going to think? Can I do this? Am I way out of my league trying to do the solo challenge? And it became a mental game. And most kids couldn't jump and catch the trapeze, even though physically they probably could. But because of the mental game of what they were trying to do, they got caught up. They were distracted. They had hesitations. And they were experiencing hindrances as they sought to complete the solo challenge. And something very similar can happen to us believers when God asks us to do something. When God asks us to step out in faith, all of a sudden there's distractions, we have hesitations, our faith becomes hindered. Today I want us to take a look at the beginning of the book of Joshua so that we can become aware of some of those hindrances to faith, and what God gives us as precautions to overcome such hindrances. Before we jump in, let's pray. Dear God, we thank you for today. We thank you for the service thus far. Lord, again, we thank you for Colton and his willingness to come down and minister with us, Lord. God, we just, we want to lift up our, our pastors, Pastor John and Lorene and their daughter, Harley, Father God, as they're away on sabbatical. Lord, we pray that you'd give them the rest that they need, the rest that they deserve. Lord, we just ask that they would have a great time together as a family, that they would do the things that they desire to do. Lord, that they would come back refreshed and recharged and ready for whatever you have next for North Kingstown Assembly of God. Lord, we pray that you'd be with us as we look to your word. We pray that you'd give us ears to hear and a heart that is open. God, we just ask that you'd speak to us, that you'd uh, grab a hold of us, Father God. Lord, that you'd do something new in our life. God, we pray these things in your holy, heavenly name. Amen. Now, one of the most important elements of our story today is going to be a promise that God gave to his people 
all the way back in the book of Genesis to a man named Abraham. In Genesis chapter 17, verse 8, God promises Abraham, he says, I will give to you and to your descendants after you the land of your sojournings, all the land of Canaan, for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. This is a promise that God gives to Israel. I'm going to give you this land, this resourceful land that you can take root in and grow in and become a prosperous nation. This is land that I'm giving to you, my people. And this isn't direction. It's not instruction. God is promising his people this land. And it is because of the promise of this land that God delivers Israel out of Egyptian slavery. He has them spend 40 years wandering the wilderness, anticipating what this promised land is going to be. And it is because of this promise that he calls Joshua to help bring the promise to fruition and finally lead his people there. The book of Joshua is the sixth book in the Bible, right? We have the first five, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, and that's called the Pentateuch. And these first five books of the Bible, except for Genesis, and aside from God himself, resolved primarily around a man named Moses. Moses is the key figure here. And I'm sure most of you know Moses. You know his story and his background. But just briefly, Moses was born in a time where God's people were slaves in the land of Egypt. Pharaoh was afraid of an uprising. He was afraid of uh, the, the uh, male Hebrew babies being born, growing up, and being a large enough army to overthrow Pharaoh, to overthrow Egyptian rule. And so out of fear, Pharaoh commissions that every male baby be slaughtered at birth. This is the context that Moses is being born into. And so upon his birth, Moses' family places him in a basket, and then they place that basket into a river. And the sister, Miriam, she stays guard. She watches what's going to happen. And Pharaoh's very own daughter is in the Nile River. She discovers the basket. She discovers baby Moses inside, and her desire is to see this baby taken care of. Her desire is to see Moses live, and so she arranges that, and Moses is Life is spared. And at some point in his adult life, via burning bush, God calls Moses to lead his people. And, you know, Moses doesn't necessarily have a career, but if you were to look at his resume, the ways that God uses him are absolutely incredible. He successfully leads the Egyptians out of slavery and out of Egypt. God uses Moses to part the Red Sea, to allow the Israelites to escape and then destroy Pharaoh and the Egyptian army in the process. He's so unique where he was able to uh, know God intimately and speak to him as a friend. He set up structure and organization within the community of God's people, and Moses was the primary intercessor and mediator between God and his people Moses' role was unparalleled. And our passage today is at the very beginning of the book of Joshua. So after those first five books, after the Pentateuch, we pick up where the promise has not yet been fulfilled. The Israelites have not yet made it to the promised land, and Moses is toward the end of his life. So if you have your Bible with you this morning, it's Uh, The book of Joshua, chapter 1, verses 1 to 6. The Bible says, Now it came about, after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, that the Lord spoke to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' servant, saying, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore, arise, cross this Jordan, you and all this people, to the land which I am giving to them to the sons of Israel. Every place on which the sole of your foot treads, I have given it to you just as I spoke to Moses. From the wilderness and this Lebanon, even as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, 
all the land of the Hittites and as far as the great sea toward the setting of the sun will be your territory. No man will be able to stand before you all the days of your life. Just as I have been with Moses, I will be with you. I will not fail you or forsake you. Be strong and courageous, for you shall give this people possession of the land which I swore to their fathers to give them. Only be strong and very courageous. It recently passed our four-month anniversary of Caitlin and I being married. Whoa, right? (laughs) But we're still settling in, and we're still learning each other's habits. And one of Kate's habits is when she's getting ready in the morning, she likes to listen to podcasts. And they're good podcasts that, you know, they're usually Christian or um, just good podcasts. And so one morning I overheard one. And it was broadcasted just a few days after uh, Queen Elizabeth II passed away. And the podcast host was talking about how um, her husband is an Englishman and how he's just so distraught over the Queen's passing. And of course, I think most people have a reverence for this specific Queen. A lot of people admire how she led and the diplomacy that she kept. And she was really just a decent woman. But as Americans watch the United Kingdom spend millions and millions and millions of dollars of, on several funerals and going a tour over the, the UK and just the long season of mourning that they're having, us Americans just don't get it. We have an election cycle every four years in this country. We have the opportunity to elect someone new or reelect the same person. And at this point, we're split 50-50. Half the nation wouldn't care if something like that happened. So we just, we're having trouble seeing what the UK is going through. She says that her husband considered, like most of the British people, the queen was like a grandmother to them. She was always there. She was queen. She sat on the the throne for over 70 years. And I don't mean to compare Queen Elizabeth II to God's prophet Moses, But as we read in Joshua chapter 1, Moses passed away. And Moses, like I said, he was always there for the Israelites. He was the chief mediator. He brought down the Ten Commandments from Mount Sinai. He was much like he was to Israel what the queen was to the UK. So his passing was a big deal. Just like whoever sits on the throne next in the UK has big shoes to fill Joshua finds himself in a similar situation. He has big shoes to fill. Moses has passed away, and now Joshua will be leading Israel. What God was asking Joshua to do was twofold. He was asking him to walk in faith, number one, to take on the mantle that Moses held, and number two, to fulfill that promise, to finally lead Israel to the promised land. As we go through this message, I'm going to be referring to faith quite a bit. And I know that all of us have different stories, different experiences, and we're all in different places with God. So faith could mean a few different things. There might be something specific that God has asked you to do. He might have asked you to do this a long time ago. This might be something recent, but nonetheless, Something that God has asked you to do, and it's going to require you to step out in faith. Some of you, God is calling to go deeper, to start taking your relationship with Christ more seriously. That's going to cause you to step out in faith. Or perhaps there's someone listening today who wouldn't consider themselves a person of faith. You've never confessed Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord, and that's going to require you to step out in faith as well. All these things will require you to step out in faith. Whatever each and every one of us might be dealing with this morning, we are likely to face hindrances. Hindrances to faith, but God will help us overcome those hindrances so we can walk in faith. Just like we mentioned the solo challenge, you've got to jump in order to complete the challenge. God's asking you to walk out in faith and obey him. 
Comparison. Don't let comparison be a hindrance to your faith. In verse 2 of our uh, chapter 1 of Joshua, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now, therefore, arise, cross this Jordan, you and all this people to the land which I am giving to them, to the sons of Israel. God was giving Joshua this mission right away. He, he, he so clearly and bluntly states, Moses is dead, Joshua. Joshua could have easily been overwhelmed by the greatness of his predecessor. He could have easily compared himself. Well, I, I'm, I'm no Moses. I'm not like Moses. I can't do what Moses did. And God says, Moses is dead. Joshua, it's your turn. When I was in Bible school, the school had a great emphasis on class unity. I was a member of the class of 2020, and I was honored to be one of the class officers. And as a team, the class officers would lead these class prayers once a month. So all the freshmen would get together, all the sophomores together, juniors and seniors, and we would have class prayers, a little service just with our classmates. And I remember we had a lot of great people in my class, and as I, I had the honor of speaking at one of these services, and I remember as the day approached, I started getting nervous. And it wasn't just regular, you know, anxiousness. I was thinking about the different people that I'd be sharing with, many of whom were already doing great things for God. There was one guy in particular, I'm not going to say his name, but let's just call him Chet. And Chet was, he was a little older than us. He was 35 years old, about. And when he prayed, it was like, like fire. When he spoke, it was so powerful. And I remember thinking, man, I'm going to be speaking to Chet. And as that day approached for that class prayer service, and I got on the platform to speak, I was still nervous. I was still actively in that comparison mindset. And I looked out and I saw Chet. But God spoke something very clearly to me. He said, Daniel, I didn't call you to be Chet. I called you to be you. And it's so easy for us as believers to just compare. We feel God lead us to do something, and then we just think about what everyone else is doing. It's so easy to fall into that. I want to read um, from 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 2 to 9. This is the Apostle Paul writing to the church of Corinth. He says, I gave you milk to drink, not solid food, for you were not yet able to receive it. Indeed, even now you are not yet able, for you are still fleshly. For since there is jealousy and strife among you, are you not fleshly? Are you not walking like mere men? For when one says, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos, are you not mere men? What then is Apollos, and what is Paul? Servants through whom you believed, even as the Lord gave opportunity to each one. I planted Apollos, watered, but God was causing the growth. So then, neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but God who causes the growth. Now he who plants and he who waters are one, but each will receive his own reward according to his own labor, for we are God's fellow workers, you are God's field, God's building. He's addressing the church of Corinth, and he's calling them out for the jealousy that's among them. And he references this fellow minister, this man, Apollos, and he says, look, Apollos may have planted the seed and now I'm watering, or vice versa. I planted the seed, and now Apollos is watering, but it would be no good for me to be jealous of what he's doing or for him to be jealous of what I'm doing because it's God who gets the glory, and it's God who does the real work. There's no reason for that type of comparison. Don't let comparison be a hindrance to your faith. God has called you to be you, and that's all he wants. Capability. Don't let capability be a hindrance to your faith. In verses 3 and 4 of Joshua chapter 1, 
he start, God begins telling Joshua about the fulfillment of the promise, what he is going to give, what he is going to provide. He says, every place on which the sole of your foot treads, I have given it to you. Just as I spoke to Moses from the wilderness and this Lebanon, even as far as the great river, this will all be your territory. Moses spent 40 years leading the Israelites to the promised land. And you look through scripture, you look at the details of this journey. There were several times where the Israelites got tired. They started bickering and complaining. At one point, they're, can we just go back to Egypt? Because they're tired of waiting for God to provide. And I'm sure Joshua felt that way sometimes too. We've been at this for 40 years. God, will you provide? It was a hindrance to his faith. Back in 2012, my grandmother and my parents they called us, all us kids, into the living room, and we, they wanted us to watch this broadcast. And this broadcast was called My Hope America, and it was marketed as Billy Graham's last sermon. I was 14 years old. I never heard of Billy Graham. I didn't care who he was. But when I watched this broadcast, God used it to minister to me. And I also developed an admiration for Billy Graham. I started listening to his messages, his crusades, reading his books, at one point in school, I got to do a, a huge project on him with a trifold board, and I just, I admired this guy a lot. And one thing that was always interesting to me was how he looked back on his teenage and young adult years. He was just an ordinary dairy farmer from North Carolina. That's it. And one day at a tent meeting, God called him to go into the world and preach the gospel. Now, to this ordinary farm boy, he probably looked around at what he had, what he'd done, what he could do, and said, God, how am I going to do that? I don't have the capability to go into the world and preach the gospel. But just like he told Joshua that he's going to provide, he provided for Billy Graham. And after a career of over 70 years in ministry, this ordinary farm boy from North Carolina has an estimated impact of, on over 2.2 billion people. He took that leap of faith. He didn't allow capability to be a hindrance to his faith. It's so easy for us to be called to do something. God asks us to do something, and all of a sudden, we start taking inventory. Uh, I don't know if that's my skill set. I don't think I have the resources for that right now. God, this isn't a good time. Maybe come back later. For the past few months, we've been doing a series in kids' church called People of the Bible. We spend a few weeks on a different uh, figure from the Bible, and we break it up into a few weeks, different seasons of these characters' life. Right now, we're in the middle of Jeremiah. And you look at Jeremiah's call in that first chapter of his book, and he calls Jeremiah to be a prophet and Jeremiah says, I do not know how to speak because I am a youth. God says, do not say I am a youth because everywhere I send you, you shall go. And all that I command you, you shall speak. We mentioned Moses earlier. We talked about that burning bush, his call to deliver and be used to confront Pharaoh and to lead the Egyptians out of Israel. Moses says, I've never been eloquent neither recently nor in time past, not since you have spoken to your servant, for I am slow of speech and slow of tongue. God says, who has made man's mouth? I will be your mouth and teach you what you are to say. God is calling you to step out in faith. We really have no excuses. God will provide. It's a cliche, but it's a powerful one. God doesn't call the qualified, but he qualifies the called. Don't let capability be a hindrance to your faith. Conflict. Don't let conflict be a hindrance to your faith. In verses 5 and 6, God says to Joshua, No man will be able to stand before you all the days of your life. 
just as I have been with Moses, I will be with you. I will not fail you or forsake you. It's natural for us to be afraid of conflict. We don't want to ruffle any feathers. We don't want to offend anyone. God forbid we offend someone. Not this past Friday, but the Friday before, a handful of us were able to go to a youth rally for teenagers and young adults. The speaker was a missionary named Don Butera. And I thought about stealing his object lesson, but I didn't want to steal it, so I'm just going to tell you about it. He had this massive plank that he threw on the stage. He had some nails in his hand, and he had a hammer in the other. And as he talked to us, he, he, he would hammer a nail right into the plank. He did one, he did two, he did three, he did a few more. And just while he was talking to us, he showed us that he was very capable of hammering nails into a plank. And so he confronted the audience and said, hey, raise your hand if you trust that I can hammer nails into a plank. And every hand in the room went up. He said, all right, cool. The hands went down. And then he said, now, who wants to hold the nail? Maybe one or two hands went up. Everyone believed, yes, you can hammer these nails into the plank, but so few trusted that they could hold that nail without getting their fingers hurt. I believe that you're going to, you know, I believe you can, God. But I, there might be conflict. There might be issues. One of my personal life verses, it's good to have life verses, right? Things that we've picked up through scripture or messages or God just put on our heart that we carry through us. They're like, they're like a weapon in our arsenal. One of mine is Proverbs 29, verse 25. It says, the fear of man brings a snare but he who trusts in the Lord will be exalted. The fear of man brings a snare, but he who trusts in the Lord will be exalted. When we talk about kids' ministry and we prepare lessons and we're downstairs working with the kids, that's just one thing I believe so wholeheartedly. If we can get these kids to stop caring about what people think, they will be set if we can get them to believe how much more valuable it is to care about what God thinks of you rather than what your classmates think of you, oh my gosh, the things that they'd be spared from, the things they'd be able to rise above. Don't care about what people think about you. Care about what God thinks of you. God tells us, he tells Joshua, no man will be able to stand before you all the days of your life. No man. Stop caring about what people think. Don't worry about man. God will go to war for you. He will fight our battles. I want to read from Paul once again. In the books of, book of Acts, chapter 20, verses 22 to 24, Paul is on these missionary journeys. He's going into new towns, and as he's heading into Jerusalem, he writes this. He says, and now behold, bound by the Spirit, I am on my way to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit solemnly testifies to me in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions await me. But I do not consider my life of any account as dear to myself, so that I may finish my course and the ministry which I received from the Lord Jesus to testify solemnly of the gospel of the grace of God. Did you hear what he said? The Holy Spirit solemnly testifies me to every city, saying that bonds and afflictions await for me. He knows what he's been called to. He knows the step of faith that God has asked him to walk into. He's going to Jerusalem, and God is saying, hey, bonds and affliction await for you. It's going to be hard. You're going to face some conflict. And he knows that. But he also trusts in God. He knows that God's going to take care of him. He knows that it's all worth it. Don't let conflict be a hindrance to your faith. The God of angel armies is always by your side. In most Bibles, that first chapter of Joshua, that first passage, verses 1 to 9, it's labeled God's charge to Joshua. 
And if we kept reading onward from verse 6, we'll see that God encourages Joshua with this simple phrase, be strong and courageous. He doesn't do it once, not twice, but three times. In verse 6, he says, be strong and courageous, for you shall give this people possession of the land which I swore to their fathers to give them. Verse 7, only be strong and very courageous. Be strong to do according to all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded you. Verse 9, be strong and courageous. Do not tremble or be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Be strong and courageous. And as I've been preparing for today, I've been reading Joshua chapter 1 a lot. I've been studying it. But last night during prayer, I opened up my Bible and just read it devotionally. And of course, there's there's lots of points here. There's lots of micro points. There's different things that could be broken down and explained. But as I read it last night, it was just so clear. God is on your side. If you're willing to take that step of faith, if you're willing to jump off the pole and reach for the trapeze, Make that jump, take that step of faith. God is on your side. If you walk in faith and obedience, God is on your side. And so if there's something that God is asking you to do, step out in faith and do it. If God is calling you deeper, step out in faith. And do it. If God is simply asking you to believe in him, step out in faith and do it. Don't allow comparison to hinder your faith. Don't allow capability to hinder your faith. Don't allow conflict to hinder your faith. This time I'd like to invite Colton back up to the stage. We're going to close in worship and just give an opportunity to respond. And start talking to God. Start figuring out what that next step of faith looks like for you. It could be something huge. It could be something small. Hey, I want you to reach out to this family member. A few months ago, we had our brother, Kenny Massey, come in, and he got us, he got, he got us to hook up stacks of Gideon Bibles. And I remember I got mine, and I said, man, I'm going to send these out to my unsaved family members. Maybe, maybe this isn't something, something I should admit, but that stack is still sitting at home. God might be calling us to do something small, encouraging us to take the step of faith. Whatever the hindrance may be, this morning we can know that God is on our side. Be strong and courageous. Do not be dismayed. For the God of angel armies is by our side. Let's pray. Dear God, we thank you for today. We thank you for the story of God's people, of your people, Lord. God, as you delivered them from Egypt, as you promised them a new land, Father God, as you used Moses and Joshua to lead them there, Father God, we see person after person in this Bible be called to do something, to step out in faith and to believe in you. And Father God, we believe that each and every person in this room has been called to walk in faith. And God, I just pray that you would bring to realization whatever hindrances we may have, Whatever hesitations we may be experiencing, whatever distractions might be keeping us off course and preventing us from taking taking that step, step of faith, God, I pray that you'd reveal it to us, and God, that you would just give us the strength and courage to make, take that next step. Lord, we love you. We thank you for meeting with us, with us today. We pray and we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. What a good word from uh, Pastor Dan. That was awesome. Um, I know myself uh, that I needed to hear that, that uh, comparison and capability and conflict are constantly getting in the way of um, 
me sharing the gospel and impacting other people's lives and just growing further and deeper with the Lord. So thank you, Pastor Dan, for that. Um, This next song we're going to be singing uh, in the second verse has uh, a part that says, you're making me like you, clothing me in white, bringing beauty from ashes, for you will have your bride, free of all her guilt and rid of all her shame and known by her true name. And that's why I sing. And then uh, your praise will ever be on my lips. And it just reminds me of the passage in Revelation 19, um, where it talks about us being the bridegroom of Christ. And um, I am so thankful for Steve and Mary Ann coming and talking about communion. And I think about the fact that we get to remember what Jesus did, and we get to remember that with joy. But we also get to remember that he's coming back, and he's coming back as the bri- as the groom, and we are the bride, and we will be dressed beautifully because of Christ. So I just want to read this passage quick. Then I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude, like the roar of many waters and like the sound of mighty peals of thunder crying out, Hallelujah. For the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and exult and give him the glory. For the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. It was granted her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure. For the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. And the angel said to me, write this. Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. If you know and have a saving under, of knowledge of Jesus Christ, that's you. You're the one who's invited to the marriage of the Lamb. You'll be that bride of Christ, and it's going to be so exciting as we walk down the aisle dressed perfectly in white, not because of our own doing, but because of Jesus Christ. So let's praise and worship Jesus for that, for clothing us in that righteousness. So if you'd like to stand and join me, you can. solid gold like a vow that is tested a covenant of old your love is enduring through the winter rain and beyond the horizon your mercy for today faithful you have been Faithful you will be, pledge yourself to me, and it's why I sing your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips, your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips, your praise will ever be on my lips. Ever be on my lips, your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips. You, Father, the Kindness makes us whole. You shoulder our weakness. Your strength becomes our own. Making me like you. Clothing me in white. Bringing beauty from ashes. For you will have your bride. Free of all her guilt. Known by your true name, and it's why I sing your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips, your praise will ever be on my lips. 
lips ever be on my lips your praise will ever be on my lips ever be on my lips your praise will ever be on my lips ever be on my lips you will be praised you will be praised with angels and saints we sing worthy are you lord you will be praised you will be praised with angels and saints we sing worthy Angels and saints, we see worthy are you, Lord. And that's why I sing your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips. Your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips. Your praise will ever be on my lips. Ever be on my lips, your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips, your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips, your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips, your praise will ever be on my lips. Ever be on my lips, your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips. Step the fall, running away when I hear you call. But Father, you worked your will. I had no righteousness of my own. I had no right to draw near your throne. But Father, you love me still. And in love, before you laid the world's foundation, you predestined to adopt me. Raise me up so I am above my station. I'm a child of God by grace and grace alone. You left your home to seek out the lost. You knew the great and terrible cause. But Jesus, your face was the same. I worked my fingers down to the bone, but nothing I did could ever atone. Jesus, you paid my debt. By your blood, I have redemption and salvation. Lord, you died that I might reap what you have sown. And you rose that I might be a new creation. I am born again by grace and grace alone. I was in darkness all of my life. I never knew the day from the night. The Spirit you made me see. I swore I knew the way on my own. Head full of rocks to help me the stone. The Spirit you moved in me. And at your touch, my sleeping spirit was awakened. Christ has shown, called into a kingdom that cannot be shaken, heaven's citizen by grace and grace alone, so I'll stand in faith by grace and grace alone, I will run 
Dear Lord, we just praise you and we thank you for your love. We thank you for your might. We thank you for all these things. God, I pray for each and every person in service today who tuned in online. Father God, I pray that we would just have a closeness to you, Lord. God, that we would walk in faith, that it would not be hindered. But Lord, we would just walk as you've asked us to walk. Bless us in health. May we be lights in this dark world. We pray, we ask these things in Jesus' holy name, amen, amen.